This will be a review for the USMLE. We'll be covering gynecology. This will be the first video. Here we'll cover contraceptives, endometriosis, primary amenorrhea, fibroids, lichen sclerosis, and cervical cancer. Uh, there are many other important topics uh, that hopefully I'll be able to cover in future videos, but they will not be covered here. I have no disclosures. We'll begin with contraceptives. There's a few points I'd like to make. With oral contraceptives, there is a stigma that they could cause weight gain. This is not true. An absolute contraindication for OCPs include a breast cancer that is hormone sensitive, uh, migraines, high blood pressure, hypertension, as well as antiphospholipid syndrome. Down here, you can see this small thing. Down here is an IUD. This can be inserted into the uterus. The string hangs out of the cervix, so it can be uh, extracted when the time comes. This is the Mirena. There's also a copper IUD. That one irritates the lining of the endometrium. The downside of the copper IUD is heavy bleeding. But finally, if you have a patient who needs an emergency contraceptive, the absolute most effective technique is the copper IUD. Endometriosis classically presents uh, with infertility. She's complaining that she has pain with defecation. When she urinates, it's pain. Uh, sexual intercourse is painful. She also she has this cyclic pelvic pain that is most prominent right before her menstruation. This, of course, is a classic description of endometriosis. The problem with endometriosis is that the inside lining of the uterus, this red area over here, is the endometrium. This is the area that sheds during menstruation. The endometrial tissue should only be in the cervix. In this condition, you have it over here in the fallopian tube, it could be in the ovary, it could be really anywhere around here, you could find endometrial tissue. If you were to do a laparoscopic procedure, which is the way to make the diagnosis, you would see this schmutz, this black area over here, this is ectopic tissue. Uh, for orientation, if you were looking down, this dome is here. Uh, these are the tubes over here, and it's being held up in these ligaments. Because it is endometrial tissue, it is hormone sensitive. So um, when the woman begins menstruating, this also begins shedding off. So the cause for this woman's infertility is most likely that there's some endometrial tissue blocking the fallopian tube so the egg and the sperm uh, don't have the opportunity to meet. This is an image of a chocolate cyst. Essentially, it is a collection of endometrial tissue that keeps adding onto itself during each menstrual cycle because it is not able to go anywhere. In this corner, I have uh, this person who's not able to lift uh, this weight to signify that the physical examination of endometriosis is usually just revealing for a immobile uterus. Importantly though, the uterus is not going to be enlarged. It is just immobile. Uh, it may be small, immobile, but it will not be enlarged. One of the treatments for this condition is oral contraceptives or NSAIDs. Alternatively, you can inhibit ovulation altogether using a GnRH agonist like Luprolide. Primary amenorrhea. Here, the mom brings in the daughter. Um, and she's concerned because her daughter has not started menstruating. And you first need to decide, is this normal or is this abnormal? The current guidelines are that if a girl has secondary sexual characteristics like uh, breast development and pubic hair, up until the age of 15, it is normal for her not to have a period. If she's older than 15, even with secondary sexual characteristics, that's abnormal. The other scenario is a girl who is 13 years old without any secondary sexual characteristics. That is also abnormal. I have over here a picture of a telephone. If you need to dial the emergency services in Pakistan, apparently the number is 15. Um, so 15 years old, 15, hopefully, hopefully this can help with remembering the number that if you're 15, even with secondary sexual characteristics, you should have had some kind of period by now. Don't quote me on this though. Uh, I saw this in Wikipedia. The next best step, assuming that, that we have primary amenorrhea, indicating that the problem here is with the ovaries, the next best step is to do a pelvic ultrasound. This is one of those new wireless ultrasounds. If I'm not mistaken, this is the liver and the right kidney, and you'd also like to measure the level of FSH. The reason you're doing a pelvic ultrasound is because it is important to identify if there are any structural or anatomical explanations for why uh, the girl has not had a period yet. For example, Asherman syndrome inside the uterus, you could have these adhesions. Another condition over here is Turner syndrome. This presents with primary amenorrhea. Uh, this man saying hi reminds me of the hymen. Uh, if you have an imperforate hymen, then, then the products of menstruation will just collect behind it. And with each period, it will just add on and add on and become more and more painful. The, the treatment for an imperforate hymen is incision and drainage. And you'd also like to get an ultrasound of the kidneys. Here is another condition that presents with primary amenorrhea. This is androgen insensitivity syndrome, where essentially you have a XY chromosome, so you have a male uh, genotype 
but a female phenotype. In this scenario, you don't have ovaries, uh, so that would be an explanation for why you have amenorrhea. Regarding fibroids, the typical presentation is an African-American female who's complaining of painless, heavy bleeding during her periods. The bleeding can become so significant that uh, she needs blood transfusions. And when you examine the uterus, uh, you find it to be mobile like this car, but it's very bumpy. So it's a mobile and bumpy uterus. What's going on here is you have these collections of connective tissue and smooth muscle with either within the wall, just below the wall, but all around the uterus, it can be pedunculated. In fact, you could have submucosal fibroids that prolapse out into the vaginal canal. Those are very painful. The imaging of choice in this case would be in ultrasound. Lichen sclerosis is commonly tested, uh, very likely because it is a precancerous condition and important to recognize. It has a bimodal presentation. Uh, the patients may either be young girls or older ladies who have already experienced menopause. And the reason for that is because it is caused by a low estrogen state, which both of them experience. They may come in complaining of some kind of discoloration, some kind of lightening of the skin, and it, uh, where it feels thinner, uh, it may be very itchy, and it can extend all the way to the perianal region. Because this is a precancerous condition, if you see this, it is very important to get a punch biopsy using this tool. Uh, I have finding Nemo here because sometimes examiners like to mention that the labia minora is lost. Uh, so finding Nemo was lost, um, so that is a, a classic description for lichen sclerosis. Cervical cancer will be the last topic that we cover. At the end of the uterus, where it transitions into the vaginal canal, there is an area that sticks out over here. This is the cervix. Here is another image of it. Up here is the uterus. Here is the upper third of the vagina. And here is the cervix. What makes the cervix so susceptible to cancer is that it is a transition zone between different types of cells. What I mean by that is that the cells over here in the vagina are stratified squamous epithelium, whereas up here they're columnar epithelium. And so every few years, uh, a woman typically gets a pap smear. You insert this tool over here, you take a long Q-tip, you get some cells from the cervix, and you look at it under a microscope. And what you're essentially looking at is for the types of cells and the way that we categorize them, they could look like this where they're normal, they're all the right shape, they have the, the purple, this little nucleus is all nice and, and homogenous, it's all the same size uh, versus later stages, for example, high grade CIN, these are high grade intraepithelial lesions or CIN3. Here you can see the purple, the nucleus are not all equal size nicely stacked on top of each other. This of course is a precancerous condition and eventually if it invades the bottom, the basement membrane, define it as a cancer. A couple of points worth noting that if you do have any kind of atypical cells in a woman who's over 35, uh, that it warrants a biopsy. If you have an older lady postmenopausal and you see endometrial cells, that also warrants a biopsy because they should not be there. Also, if you have a pregnant woman who comes in and you have a, and you see they have CIN3, this is something that you'd like to do in immediate colposcopy. I have over here a speedometer because the speed limit on highways is usually 65. Uh, this is to help me remember that the age where you stop doing pap smears is 65 years old. Assuming that everything was normal until then, you would stop at the age of 65. Here is a macroscopic view of what the cervix would look like. Uh, here is normal the low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, high-grade, and here it is cancer once it already starts invading the, the tissue beneath it. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible.